Hello and welcome to the Columbia Daily Tribune's college football webcast. This is sports editor Joe Waljasper along with Tribune football beat writer Dave Matter. Dave, when last we met, we were assuming that the Insight Bowl was a foregone conclusion. Um, didn't work out that way. Nope. They ended up in the Texas Bowl. The Insight Bowl picks Iowa State. And then the Independence Bowl picks Texas A&M, two 6-6 six and six teams. And 8-4 and four Missouri falls to the last Big 12 Bowl spot, the Texas Bowl. Um, your thoughts on the whole process and whether Missouri should be aggravated by that? Yeah, I think they have a right to be a little bit aggravated. I think in the end... The destination they're going to, the Houston Bowl, or the Texas Bowl in Houston, it's not so bad. Uh, Much better TV deal being on ESPN rather than NFL Network, which is available to about half as many households across the country. Uh, The opponent, I think, is more interesting, Navy, probably more competitive than it would have been the Insight Bowl against a 6-6 and Minnesota that doesn't really get you too excited. Um, But I think the process and how it happened, I think, has to be disappointing for Missouri, the fact that they were picked over uh, by two bowl games that, that sort of rejected Missouri and went for six and six teams. I think there's just a sense of pride in that, that you, you play to win the games and you, you, you tell your players that there's rewards for winning, and then it turns out that if, if the reward is a bowl game, it really doesn't work out that way because mm-hmm. the Big 12, uh, you know, they, they really sort of sold their soul to bigger payouts from these bowl games and, and allowed it to be a system that is unregulated, that any, any bowl can take anyone as long as they're eligible, and it comes down to uh, to wanting bigger crowds, which I think all bowl games want. But they also want uh, there to be some sort of integrity in the process. In the Big 12, you really don't have that. Um, they don't really care so much about how you did on the field um, to a degree. And, and, it, and that's how this worked out with the Insight Bowl, who a week ago was, was trying to dismiss the talk that they would care that much about what Iowa State did nine years ago. And, and turns out that was the factor for why they took them. Yeah. I think you do have to keep in mind, though, Missouri is part of the Big 12, and the schools voted on wanting right. to do it that way. They wanted the money, and this is kind of what happens. I think a lot of things kind of conspire against Missouri to where I don't know that this is going to be, you know, it's kind of almost happened three years in a row, and I think it will probably continue to happen if they don't change the way they do things because I think they're going to continue to not draw very well to bowl games because they continue to get stuck in bowl games that their fans aren't excited about. Right. And so that's a factor. Ge- Geography is a factor. I mean, if you're talking about drawing fans, you know, half the bowl, Big 12 Bowls are in Texas, so the South Division teams are going to be more attractive in that way. Um, and then just, they're not really a novelty factor. Like, you know, with Iowa State, they don't go to bowls much, so um, maybe there would be, you know, now we've made one, there's going to be a bigger, whereas Missouri kind of goes to one every year almost. Sure. So a lot of things kind of conspire against them in that way. And I guess if you think of, of it as you should get what you deserve, then yeah, it's disappointing, but I think anyone who thinks the college football postseason you get what you deserve hasn't been paying much attention. Right. I mean, the whole system is set up to try to match the top two teams, and then beyond that, it's it's kind of just a grab bag. And, sure. And you can't get, let your self-esteem get too wrapped up in that, I don't think. Uh, early thoughts on the matchup with Navy. It's kind of interesting. You don't see a lot of teams that play the way they do. They're an option team, uh, as a lot of the academies are. Um, just how do you think Missouri matches up against Navy? Well, Missouri is right outside the top ten nationally in rushing defense, so that, that's good because you're going to see a lot of uh, running the ball against Navy. They, they have only thrown the ball 89 times in 12 games, which is by far the fewest in the country. Although they can throw it fairly effectively at times when they have to. When they played Ohio State, uh, Ricky Dobbs is their quarterback. He threw for 156 yards. His quarterback rating was better than any quarterback had against Ohio State this year. So, And that was a close game up until the finish. So they've proven that at least if, if they absolutely have to, they can maybe be a little more effective throwing the ball. And it doesn't take much to be effective against Missouri's defense when you're talking about throwing the ball. So mm-hmm. we'll, we'll see how they go about that. Uh, I, I think when you're playing a, a real run-oriented team like Navy, you almost you have to be really good on offense uh, because Navy's going to try to control the clock and, and, and dictate the tempo of the game. And I would expect Missouri to have a pretty good game offensively against Navy. You would think Missouri's got the better athletes, probably stronger and bigger up front just mm-hmm. because of the, the differences in recruiting. Uh, but, but they shouldn't overlook this game. And Navy, obviously, like we said, played Ohio State tough. They mm-hmm. played Pittsburgh tough. Uh, they beat Notre Dame. And Notre Dame obviously has good athletes too, so uh, it's it's an interesting matchup, and it's it's mm-hmm. a different style of play, like you said. It's unique. 
just playing a service academy, I think is pretty cool. So, uh, you know, it, I think it, in that regard it worked out. Much more interesting than playing in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. In terms of just facing a regular or pure option team, I think, you know, Kansas State ran a little bit of regular option from under center, but that's probably about it as far as Missouri's Nevada, seen. too, a little bit. They were more out of the shotgun. More out of the shotgun there. also, yeah. Um, and then just lastly, we're going to discuss our Heisman thoughts, and this is where we're going to have a great head-to-head -head battle, and then it turns out we basically had the same ideas, but yeah. go over who, who you like for the Heisman. Well, I, I went with uh, Ndamukong Su, the Nebraska defensive tackle. I just thought his performance against Texas just put him over the top, and it was unlike anything I've seen from a defensive player in a game. I mean, he just that, that was supposed to be the best offensive line in the Big 12, and, and he just absolutely manhandled them. Uh, at, at Missouri's bowl announcement uh, event on Sunday night, I kind of did an informal poll talking to some of the players and coaches there who they thought they would vote for if, if they had a Heisman vote, and it was hands down Sue. I mean, they were mm -hmm. that impressed. And that takes a lot for a Missouri player to say that about a Nebraska player that they're supposed to dislike and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, root against, but, but they were really impressed. And if you just look at his body of work, what he's done as a defensive tackle, when it, every game going in you know the offense is, is game planning to stop him, uh, there is no stopping him, so he's that good. And after him, I went with uh, Toby Gerhardt, the running back at Stanford. He had, he's got some really impressive stats. Against ranked teams this year, he averaged 200 yards rushing. I, I thought mm -hmm. that was really impressive. He didn't really have a bad game. He was just good every week. And then third, I went with Mark Ingram, the running back at Alabama. Against the rugged SEC, he averaged almost 130 yards a game, six yards a carry. I thought that was really impressive. And he, he was the best player on the field offensively in the SEC title game the other day. So th those are my top three. I also went with Sue first, and even before the Big 12 championship game, that was kind of my guy, unless something weird happened that weekend. And with him, I almost feel like if, if not now for a defensive player, th then when, when would it be? Because there's right. not a real standout, dominant offensive guy. And this guy, I'm trying to remember a defensive player that has been as dominant as him, and I'm drawing a blank. I mean, the year Charles Woodson won it, it was... It was more, it had a lot to do with his work returning kicks and stuff like that. But this guy, like you said, he, he's someone that he kind of draws constant double teams and it just doesn't matter, right. you know. And I think a lot of times quarterbacks and running backs tend to win this thing because they're the, the people that just the casual observer, you can appreciate whether they're doing well or poorly. And it's very hard a lot of times when you can, to judge someone who's literally in the very middle of the whole mess. Right. And still, still even with that, he just jumped out and grabbed you. So I thought he was the best by far. And then I also went Gerhardt second for the reasons you mentioned. My third pick was uh, C.J. Spiller, just because I thought he kind of affected the game in a lot of ways as a returner, receiver, and running back. Uh, he was good in all three. Oddly enough, none of those teams was a great team. I think they all maybe lost four games, so that's a little bit of a departure from what you usually think of with the Heisman. But it's been kind of a weird year for the Heisman. I think it's probably... I'm not sure that there's ever been just a depth of guys where you just nobody is an obvious favorite. Yeah, and, and this year I was really against voting for a quarterback, especially the two that 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 we're told to vote for because mm -hmm. they're they're so uh, well known and have had such decorated careers. Colt McCoy and Tim Tebow. I just think if you look at their numbers this year, they just don't stack up. They, they by far did not have their best year of their mm -hmm. career. Their, their teams were were excellent. Texas in the national championship game, but McCoy's numbers. I voted for the AP All-American team. You get a first and second team choice at quarterback. I, I didn't even put him second team. I just I didn't think he was that good. So next on my list would have been Spiller. Uh, Kellen Moore, the quarterback at, at yeah, Boise, I, I like him a lot. And and LaMichael James is another one, the, the running back at Oregon, kind of overshadowed by their quarterback there. But he, he's put up some excellent numbers too. So, yeah, not a, not a great year for quarterbacks, and that I agree. That's, that's the year to, to go with the best defensive player, and he might be the best defensive player we've seen in a long time with Sue. I would have voted probably for Denario Alexander before. Colt McCoy. I agree. Um, okay, we're going to take a break from the uh, football webcast for a few weeks as they get ready for the bowl game, and then we'll come back before the bowl game and do another one. 